All right, guys, how's it going? Last night at a club in Budapest in Hungary, AMD held a rather low-key and curious event where they compared their upcoming RX Vega graphics card to what appeared to be a GTX 1080, with both systems running ultra-wide monitors, FreeSync and G-Sync, with the premise being that both systems should offer very similar, if not identical, gameplay. Now, I was following this as it was all unfolding, mostly via AMD Reddit and Twitter, and very quickly the reports appeared to be that the left system was noticeably smoother than the right. This was running Battlefield 1 at 100Hz, not 4K resolution but ultra-wide. Now, it was a rumour that the NVIDIA system was running the GTX 1080, but people at the event did report that this is what they had been told before the event started, and the initial assumption was that the left system, the smoother system, was the one with the GTX. 1080. However, a Hungarian, presumably attendee of the event, recorded the start of the presentation, uploaded it to YouTube with English subtitles, and here we can see that the presenter clearly appears to be pointing to the left system when he mentions Vega. So perhaps a little clue here that the left system is in fact the Vega system, with the right system being the GTX 1080. And again, if all goes well, you won't be able to tell them apart. This was clearly not the case though as multiple sources claimed that the left system was faster and smoother, with the right system sometimes dipping into the 50s to mid 50s frames per second. Another attendee managed to take photographs from the side of the systems, so here we can see the one on the left. The important part here is the text on the right hand side of the monitor. Right at the top, just visible here is what looks like a white line, and as you might imagine, there's not an awful lot of 100Hz ultra-wide FreeSync monitors out there, and over at Computerbase, they have a bunch of images of the ASUS Designo Curve MX34 VQ, and on picture 5, we can just about see the same white line of text at the very top right of the monitor, so this is almost certainly the FreeSync monitor on the left hand side. Now the right hand monitor is a little bit more tricky to pin down, but again, there's not an awful lot of ultra wide 100Hz G-Sync monitors out there, but the belief here is that they used the ASUS ROGUE SWIFT PG348Q. Here's another image of it, if you see this little G-Sync sticker down the bottom left, you can just about see a sticker there. The bezel doesn't look exactly right, but it's difficult to tell from this angle. It is pretty much certain to be those two monitors though. Now another giveaway here is that AMD claimed the FreeSync system, that is the graphics card and the monitor, will cost $300 less than the G-Sync system. And checking out one or two reviews across the web, it does appear that the FreeSync monitor costs around $800, however the price of the G-Sync monitor appears to come in around $1300, which is $500 more. It may well be the case that the G-Sync monitor is now quite a bit cheaper than that, however it would need to be $1100 for for the $300 difference to make sense here, and that would be if the graphics cards were the same cost. Now here's where things get a little bit strange though, because on checking a bunch of videos of Battlefield 1, it became clear that the GTX 1080 should have been capable of holding more than 60 frames per second at the ultra wide resolution. Here we can see a comparison at 4K, now 4K is 8 million pixels, compared to only 5 million of ultra wide, that's like a difference of almost 70%. And for sure we can see here, with the Frontier Edition on the left and the GTX 1080 in the middle, the Frontier Edition is faster, quite a lot faster in some cases. But generally speaking the GTX 1080 holds up pretty well, in some scenes it really struggles. But again, it is a big difference between 4K and ultra wide. And another video of a GTX 1080, although this is DX11, clearly shows it capable of running the game at 70 frames per second plus. What is interesting though is that the GTX 1070, once again running on an ultra wide monitor, does tend to score around the mid 50s. So what could that all be about? I guess it's possible that AMD is running both systems in DX12 and the GTX 1080 is not performing as well in DX12. If that's the case then that would be pretty sneaky of AMD to do such a thing. You can argue about whether or not it's a valid comparison or not then, but they really ought to be using the best API for both graphics cards. If that means DX11 on the GTX 1080, DX12 on Vega, then that's what they should have shown. Or maybe it was actually a GTX 1070, that would certainly make the $300 comparison make more sense. 
If the G-Sync monitor is $500 more than the FreeSync monitor, and yet Vega RX is $200 more than the GTX 1070, that could explain that. I'm not a huge fan of that theory, in all honesty, but it's worth consideration anyway. Another possible option here is that we could be looking at customised settings. The game running on Ultra on both systems, however, with the possibility of both maybe running higher quality anti-aliasing, for example, super sampling. Now, what makes me believe that? Well, first of all, the GTX 1080 dipping into the mid-50s, which it should not do at this resolution, but super sampling could cause that. But why would the Vega system not suffer so badly? Well, we've heard all about the high bandwidth cache and how this is supposed to help with minimum frame rates, especially in cases where VRAM could be a limitation. Now, certain types of anti-aliasing are very memory hungry, with super sampling being an extreme case. The GTX 1080 could be cratering here because of something like that, whereas Vega might not be affected quite so badly. So that's another interesting one to think about. Overall though, the whole thing kind of reeks of AMD's Radeon Technology Group marketing. Doing a comparison FreeSync versus G-Sync, pointing out the price differences, this is very much something that AMD marketing would do rather than concentrate purely on the performance. The whole thing though where they claimed that both systems should give almost identical performance and a very similar experience, whereas in reality the left system appeared to be much smoother, that part is a little bit bizarre. But if we've learned one thing about AMD marketing, it is that they very much move in mysterious ways and it's difficult to really figure out what exactly is going on in their head. I did read an interesting theory though, and that theory was that the Nvidia card was a GTX 1070, and then at the next event coming up in a few days, they will put the RX Vega up against the GTX 1080 and again ask people to note which one was the smoothest and then perhaps at the final event before the launch, they might compare Vega to a 1080 Ti and again ask the attendees to note which one was smoothest. Theoretically, above 60 frames per second, free sync, G sync, the 1080 Ti and Vega should be close enough in performance that it would be very, very difficult to tell one from the other. And this looks like it is likely to be the message that AMD is trying to put across here. Whatever you think about that, it's up to you but it seems like a choice that maybe the loser would take. And while a lot of people are disappointed about the whole FreeSync G-Sync comparison thing, to me it is completely valid, especially when the G-Sync monitors are costing three, five hundred dollars more for what is effectively the same technology. I do believe that AMD is right to point that out. That'll do us for Vega right now though, we'll hear more about it over the coming days. Moving on to Intel and the 7920X, that is their 12 core Skylake X CPU. Now, this is a rather curious one as well, and this video was sent to me by a viewer last night. Very strange, but it appears that the guys at PC World got hold of the specs of the 7920X's base clock speed, coming from an Intel product sheet which they printed out, and we can see the PC World guys here. Now, it's pretty interesting that 2.9 GHz base clock is really not very high at all. If we just compare it to the i9-7900X, which has a base frequency of 3.3 GHz. Now, we didn't find out what the turbo frequencies are, but with a 2.9 GHz base clock, 12 cores, and from what we know about Skylake X's issues with power and temperatures, it's really not a huge surprise. 2.9 GHz on 12 cores, it maybe runs around 3.2 with an all-core turbo. The point here really is that it's unlikely to be all that much faster than the 7900X. This is of course very valid to AMD as well, because just last week AMD showed us the performance of the Threadripper 1920X and 1950X. Two SKUs, one with 16 cores and the other with 12 cores, and the 12 core 1920X has a base clock of 3.5 GHz and a turbo of 4. Now with XFR you're probably talking 3.6 GHz. So compared to the 7920X, look at how these numbers line up quite nicely, yeah? It looks like it's going to be a very, very close fight until you look at the prices. Well, the 1920X can be got for 50% less than the $1200 7920X. We are really beginning to see the difference that the Infinity Fabric is making here. These can be made so cheaply for AMD that the prices are massively more compelling than their Intel counterparts. The 1920X versus the 7920X could end up a very close fight, but Intel's got bigger worries of course because the 16 core 1950X at 3.4 base and 4 GHz turbo, while still coming in below $1000, is a CPU that will be easily ahead of the 7920X. Intel has got real issues here. They are either unable or unwilling to compete on price. 
Looking at the two Threadripper CPUs, the 1950X looks like great value and the 1920X looks like amazing value against the Intel CPUs. But compared to each other, I have to say that the 16 core 1950X really does look like it is quite a bit better value than this $800 12 core 24 thread 1920X. I would have liked to have seen this one just a little bit cheaper, maybe $749. But those are the prices and, well, it's really difficult to say anything bad about them simply based on the prices of the competition. I do, however, expect to see more SKUs coming later. There's no reason why we can't have 12 and 16 cores around the 3 GHz base clock, coming in at prices well below these two. Launching the more expensive parts first is a common tactic these days, and it's one that all of these companies do now. Now finally, I'm going to talk a bit about NVIDIA, and the way they're behaving today is of extreme interest to me. After Ryzen launched, you perhaps saw a video where NVIDIA recommended it for one of their GeForce battle boxes. That alone was pretty interesting. Up until recently, NVIDIA would do their best to not even mention AMD. They were in direct competition, and simply put, NVIDIA has always seen AMD as being the enemy. But like I said, after Ryzen launched, this all seemed to have changed. And again, we can see over at NVIDIA.com, the recommendations for their BattleBox Ultimate GTX 1080 Ti, with the CPUs being i7s, i9s, or AMD Ryzen 7s, or AMD Ryzen Threadrippers. And even the cheaper Essential BattleBox recommends a GTX 1060, with the CPU recommendations being an i5 or Ryzen 5. So this is a definite change in strategy. And a few days ago, they're at it again. With the blog post, Intel and AMD just delivered two great reasons to upgrade your data center. Now, NVIDIA is selling more and more graphics cards to the data center. And in a way here, they are taking business away from Intel far more than they are from AMD. And the blog post starts with, think of it as a multiple choice test with no wrong answers. Intel last week launched its new Skylake Xeon CPUs. AMD last month launched their next generation Epic CPU. And these are both great options that strengthen the case for upgrading your server infrastructure now. Now again, it's just very, very curious to me to see NVIDIA recommending AMD. And I believe it is a sign of the times. NVIDIA has now sort of moved into the Intel tier. And I think they've finally realized that AMD are simply no threat on the graphics front. So now they're kind of doing what Intel used to do a few years ago. Intel were always very good at playing NVIDIA and AMD against each other. That old divide and conquer thing. Now it appears that the tables have turned and NVIDIA is now doing the same thing with Intel and AMD. Put yourself in NVIDIA's shoes. They know they've got the graphics market sewn up. Consumers are utterly brainwashed to the NVIDIA brand and they've held the performance crown for a very long time now and Vega does not appear to be changing that. So now NVIDIA is almost certainly thinking they can meddle in Intel's fortunes and what better way to weaken them by advertising Ryzen, Threadripper and now Epic. There is of course a technical reason as well. We know that Intel's been going nowhere for years. It's getting worse in fact because KB Lake was the same as Skylake just with a slight boost to the clock speed, but with no IPC gain, and now even Skylake X, in many cases is a regression in performance. So not only is Intel not moving forward, they appear to be going backwards. This is not good for Nvidia on the desktop, because as Nvidia's graphics cards get faster, they're more likely to be held back by slower CPUs, and they must know that the future is multi-core, and who is more likely to give them the multiple cores? That is of course AMD. Now it's true that Intel will be launching Coffee Lake with six cores on the desktop, but it must be obvious to NVIDIA now that Intel are doing as little as they possibly can to maintain their position, whereas AMD will throw everything into more cores, even creating the APIs that make use of more cores and ultimately benefit both AMD and NVIDIA. So this one's getting interesting. And I expect these two, that is NVIDIA and Intel, to be having a real go at each other soon. And let's be honest, who wouldn't love to see that happen? Right, so that's it for this one. I am rapidly approaching 50,000 subscribers. It's been a pretty long road, but I'm getting there. And I might get there by the end of the week. So it'll be interesting to see what happens once I hit the 50,000. And to celebrate my 50,000, I'm doing one of those videos again. One of those big thought-provoking ones. And it's hopefully going to be a massive eye-opener. Hopefully you'll see that one by the beginning of next week. Though it is a big video and a lot of work, so no promises on that one. So don't forget to like and 
and subscribe, help me get to 50,000 sooner, and of course check out the description for a bunch of links to everything I talked about in the video. I'll catch you later guys.